all your stuff What can figure it out That's how it chooses you Hey Claire! Hello! Teresa Sparks! It's so good to see you! Hello! <laughs> How's them things going? Uh, them things is going really well. I haven't gone to work for the last two days, which has been great. Yeah, school's starting, and I was like, I, mm -mm, nope, not not doing that. Not doing that yeah. today. I don't want to work full-time and be in school full-time, turns out. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> Stupid. So I want to thank you. I I need to thank you. So <laughs> what – okay. <laughs> you gave me a media assignment for this conversation. Yes. You said, Teresa – have you watched Bridgerton? And I said, no, but it's been coming up in my Netflix. And yeah. you said, you should watch at least the first four episodes and we will talk about it. Yeah. And I said, okay, partially because I was interested already and partially because I owe you. Because the last thing you told me to watch had some disastrous consequences for us and everyone who listens to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt, I felt a little more sure about this one. I will say that. This was a genuine recommendation, not an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we can talk about the fact that we we proposed an experiment and then you got mad at the results. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm like, I'm sorry. This is why I'm not a scientist. <laughs> You're just like smashing fucking test tubes. Fuck you. I expect certain results. If I don't get them, I get mad. Yeah. Scientist has that wonderful ability to be like, we'll just see what happens and like be open right. to multiple different you know, reactions and results. Um, yeah. So thank you. This is It Chooses You, Smidgen Edition. Smidgen Edition. Yeah. Smidgen Edition. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, we, um, we're going to talk to you a little more frequently. We are interested in providing, some, talking about some kind of fun media, game, etc. Uh, and just talking it over and letting you guys uh, know what we think about it. So, hi, happy, whatever day this comes out. <laughs> in, in case you didn't realize, we will be talking about the Netflix show Bridgerton today. Yes. <laughs> I should just say up front that... Bridgerton is a series about the lives and loves of the socially elite in Regency England. Yeah. It is a Shonda Rhimes produced television show. So I think Shonda Rhimes just recently made a deal with Netflix uh. and she's going to be producing uh, quite a bit of content for them. So this is a Shondaland production uh. and there's a, a little bit of, of what you would expect from a Shonda Rhimes produced show and there are a few surprises as well. So yeah. you said you wanted to talk about the moment you realized you knew what you were watching. Yeah, because as is my custom, I did not do any Googling before I started watching it. I was like, I'm Good just sometimes yeah. like to let art flow over me. And in this case, what that led to was me not understanding what this show was until about the middle of episode three. And then mm -hmm. I was like why are they talking about masturbating right now? What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly it was a porno for an episode and a half. And I was like, yeah. Oh, and now it's just porn. Okay. What's so, so we should say everyone, in case you don't realize there, there will be some spoilers for the first season of Bridgerton in this episode. So please uh, maybe skip this one. If you don't want to know what happens if you, or, or finish it and then come back. Yes, yes. The spoil I'm, I'm absolutely no spoiler protection lies within. So what I thought I was watching was an eight episode season, but I didn't believe that it was a season. I believed it was just like a mini series, you know, and that mm -hmm. this is all there's going to be. Um, eight episodes about the search for a husband of one young lady mm -hmm. in Regency England. And I was like, okay, I think I know what I'm going to get. I can imagine what this is. And for the first two episodes, it fully supports all of your, most of your presuppositions about what's going to happen, right? Very Jane Austen. Very right? Jane Austen. We could say. Very high waists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very tightly pulled back hair. Mm -hmm. Very deliberately sculpted curls. Yes. Very sexy hand touching. The, breathless, the breathlessness of a hidden touch of hands. Oh my god. Yeah. Amazing. Oh yeah. And then suddenly I was like, oh shit. And then at the point at which it became a porno, I was like, okay, now I'm going to read things about this. And at that <laughs> point, I, because I needed help. I needed to reach out. I, I was like, I am now lost 
And I need someone to tell me where the fuck I am. And I understand that continuing to watch will show me where I am. But I got very, very nervous because I hadn't expected it. And then suddenly he's like, have you ever touched yourself? And I'm like, what the fuck is happening right now? Yeah. So, so there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is that it is a wildly inconsistent show. Yeah. But another way to look at it is that those inconsistencies become surprises and delightful surprises at that on occasion. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. (laughs) The thing I appreciate about it is that in the sort of Regency England, Jane Austen type world, of which I have seen many a show, many a a movie, the woman's usefulness ends the moment she's married. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I appreciated that this didn't function that way. Mm -hmm. That, oh my Mm -hmm. God, she still has a life and that involves sex and the the question of I mean, we're still limited here right sex and the question of bearing children you know yeah <laughs> not so much like what's your passion girl what do you want to do with your life <laughs> those yeah. aren't uh, options at this period of time yeah. but but i think it is kind of cool to see the intimacy because it's a part that you know must have been part of life but we never get to see it because all of that thing is sort of hidden away behind very ornate doors, you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in that well, era. I love the idea. And that's a really good way of talking about it, I think, because I love this idea that, it, I mean, it seems to be putting forward the idea anyway, that like all of the things that we associate with Regency manners are things that happen in public. And then their private lives, they're pretty much just like us now. They're just humping away. I I don't know if it's historically accurate or not. I'm going to guess it's not. But it's super entertaining. I I do have a question for you. So there were a couple of things that I found troubling. Mm. So when you start the show... So I've actually been wishing that someone would make a, a period piece... And incorporate actors of color for a long time. Yes. And and not as the roles you might expect them in society. <laughs> yeah. So I've been sort of, uh, I, I, I acknowledge that colorblind casting is its own issue mm-hmm. in a way, but I have been yearning for a colorblind mm-hmm. casting version of a period piece for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that's what this was. And yeah. for the first few episodes, yeah. you think that that's what it is. And, and that would be fine. That's its own thing. There's this one conversation that occurs between two characters of color, Lady Danbury and the Duke. It's a very brief conversation where they make reference to the fact that the reason why people of color have been elevated in society is because the king has married a woman of color. And they also make mention of the idea that if that king were to toss her aside then they would be lowered in society just as quickly as they were elevated in society. So suddenly you realize that they're they're justifying the presence of yeah. actors of color, yeah. and yet they don't go into it. And so that was really unsatisfying. And I, I don't know why the show writers made that decision. I don't understand it. Yes. This is one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about today, mm-hmm. right? Because it's literally a single conversation. It's maybe 12 to 15 seconds. She mm-hmm. asserts something real weird, given the things we know about the rest of the story. Like we find out later that the Duke, who is a man of color and whose father is a man of color and whose, whose mother is a woman of color, right? His father is at at the same age or slightly older than the queen, but he's a man of color who's a duke. And so that sentence makes no sense in the context of the story. To me, it doesn't make any sense, which says to me that it is the direct result of a focus group or a producer saying we need to explain the presence of people of color here. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it feels real gross to me after that, assuming yeah. if if I'm right and my assumptions about where that's coming from are true, then I'm like, oh, what if we didn't have to justify it? What if we could just right. have this be, I mean, like so much of the story is there's historical realism, but it's fiction. And yeah. why do you have to justify the presence of actors of color in your fiction? What the fuck is that yeah. about? You know? Well, and it makes me wonder, because this is a series of books, which I haven't yeah. read, yeah. it makes me wonder, 
are there characters of color in the books? Mm -hmm. What a great Is question. that gone into in the books? Or was this sort of an artistic woke choice on the part of the people who created the show? Mm -hmm. And then they felt like they had to address it or, like you said, had a focus group that indicated that they should go into it. Yeah. Yeah. It just it raises a, a bunch of uncomfortable and unpleasant questions, which is not to say yeah. I stopped watching because I didn't. But I was like, oh, out of nowhere. Yeah. It came out of nowhere. It's like yeah. it's like they felt the need to answer a question I wasn't asking. <laughs> I'm like, why right. do you why are you answering that question? Well, and it indicates that we're suddenly in an alternate reality, right? Exactly. Right? Yeah, which is not not really the tone that is set mm -hmm. from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's one of those things that actually makes me stop and really think. And it's one of the reasons I watch. It. So. I have to tell everyone, because I need credit for all the work I ever do or think about doing, that I have watched it through twice, because mm -hmm. I wanted to come prepared, and because that scene really made me question all of it, and I was like, yeah. I need to get a better handle on this, because what's actually happening? I think the reason that scene was so jarring is because I was delighted by the fact that the casting was diverse. Like, I was like, this is awesome, perfect, just like yeah. you. And so I was like, oh, that's so great, we're just going to do it. And then yeah. we're, we're just doing it for like four episodes before they feel the need to comment on the fact that they're doing it. And it was kind of, I had that same feeling about a couple of other things in the, in the show too. Like, we're just going to do that. Great. I can accept that we're just doing it. Oh, now we're commenting on the fact that we're doing it. Let me just say this, that I, that is the thing. And I kept going, why do I still like this now? Mm. <laughs> But I did. I mean, it's an incredibly gorgeous it's show from a visual perspective. Yeah, it's I do enjoy period pieces that are, are based on this rigid set of manners and process. And then also seeing those things broken down mm -hmm. and seeing everyone freak out mm -hmm. when when the rules are not adhered to, mm -hmm. to the letter. You yeah. Know? Well, and how interesting to be watching a show where... Someone kisses someone and they're not married, and that is the cause for a duel to the death. A kiss mm -hmm. is the cause for a duel to the death, and then four scenes later, it's a porn. Like, that was so interesting to me. I was like, here is this rigidity, and then later, the other side of it is just, like, sex in every room in your house, and on every yeah. acre of your property, and, in you know, on the roof, and on a horse, yeah. and in a whatever, you know? And so when you say it's uneven, I think that's sort of one of the main things that I think of is what set of rules apply in this situation? Like, I want to understand them so I know when they've been broken. And we're moving back and forth between sets of very different rules very quickly. And also, the so we're talking about, so the, the just a real quick brief thing about the plot. The plot of is that a young lady needs a husband and how's she going to find one? That's the whole plot. And then we... After two episodes, you realize that's not the whole plot. It goes on and on and on. And as you say, it's now what's happening after she's married. Like, what's the, you know, yeah. what's the continuation of her life, etc. I did some research on the books after. So there are eight books. Each book is about one of the children of the Bridgerton family. The first is about Daphne. I'm not sure what order the rest of them go in. But each book is about one of those people. Mm -hmm. And this, the events that happen, is, you know, from their perspective, what's going on right now. And the series as a whole, I think, is narrated by a mysterious voice uh, called Lady Whistledown, who's a gossip columnist, who's commenting on all of the things that are happening and, and is the reason that some people know things they shouldn't know and things get reported that were a secret, etc., Right. So basically she functions as like what Julia Kristeva called like the eruption of the unconscious into the conscious. She's the gateway between what's hidden and what's visible, and she mm. makes the hidden visible, and that's sort of the, the function she has in the story, this gossip columnist. Very well put. Why, thank you. I studied literature. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then and a, like a, a subplot here is who is, who is Lady Whistledown? Like the, mm -hmm. the attempt to discover who this is is kind of a, a major subplot. One one of the most fascinating subplots. Mm -hmm. You watch one of the Bridgerton sisters try and figure out who Lady Whistledown is, and there's a great scene where she goes and she accuses one of the servants, <laughs> and <laughs> and the servant literally just starts fucking laughing at her, 
and is like, do you know how much shit we have to do in a day? Who the fuck do you think is sitting up here (laughs) between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., the three hours that you allow us to sleep in a night? Who do you think is sitting up here gossiping about all the nonsense you guys get up to? No, no, I got fireplace grates to scrub, bitch. Get out of my way. (laughs) <laughs> she also says, do you think if I, this is obviously paraphrasing, but she also says, do you think if I was making that sweet, sweet whistle down money, I would be living here and working for you? Yeah. <laughs> and I do have to say, there's another great moment in the same vein, which is when Daphne and her older brother, Anthony, go down to have a hot glass of, or a warm glass of milk yeah. in the middle of the night. Uh-huh. And decide not to wake the servants and then realize that they don't know how to work the stove. (laughs) I think the show works best when it's living in that world of poking a gentle finger at privilege. Yeah. And and poking that gentle finger at basically these cultural elites. Rather than taking on social justice issues that it has no intention of actually addressing. Yeah. That's... mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. Well, and maybe it intends to address, because this is season one and this is book one. There are eight books. I'm assuming they right. they were going to make eight seasons of eight episodes each about each of these characters. That's, that's my assumption for the direction this thing is going. Mm-hmm. And so maybe they will deal with their shit later, right? Yeah. But it just felt real weird to have it, like, injected. The other thing that's true in the same vein, there are a collection of awesome little moments that are beautiful to me because they show us what it might look like to acquire active consent in the middle of a sex act. Like Mm -hmm. that happens. Someone asks, do you want me to stop? No, really? Like, let's pause. Do you want me to, I need an answer. Right? So that's awesome. We also see women who are not informed of the sexual abilities of their own bodies um, being educated, right? Which is yeah. which is good to me. And I like that. But then the way that these things happen and the context they happen in is like, I haven't parsed it all. And it seems like it could be very problematic. Like, why does a woman, why does she not hear that from her mother? Is that a societal yeah. thing? It would have been a societal thing at the time, probably historically accurate. But if we're going to then have her fake suitor instructing her in masturbating, I had a strong emotional reaction, and this is probably really personal, to her not being educated about sex. Yeah. That conversation with her mother, where her mother shies away from actually saying anything. That's right. And then the subsequent, the fact that she has to go to her personal maid, I found that so frustrating that her mother wouldn't tell her anything. She'd be forced to go to the maid. And I felt like so much misery in this show could have been easily averted by communication. Yes. And this is why I wanted to talk about Daphne and Simon's marriage as well, because as, as eventually happens in the show, when she discovers why he doesn't want an heir. Yeah. She's like, Oh, I kind of fucking get it. Yeah. You know, which is the way you as the viewer feel. Yeah. So rather than those societal missteps, creating more drama and more tension, for some reason, they were just simply frustrating. Yeah. And I I wonder if I experienced that same frustration, and I wonder if it might be about the fact that in regard to their marriage in particular, they are so open and relatively direct with each other during sex and talking about sex. Mm-hmm. And so then my question is, that was a, that should be according to some the historical reality right that should have been the most difficult thing to communicate directly about right and they've somehow managed to accomplish it they're there right right? but then they can't talk about normal shit like my dad was a jerk my dad was a total monster and i don't want to have kids because i hate him like and that i'm like what what come on yeah i i think that that some of the frustration is personal for me as a woman watching that. But I think that some of the frustration is because of the inconsistency of the show. Yeah. Which is what you're pointing at. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's it's a bodice ripper. It's a romance. It's the, the mm-hmm. books that it's based on, they're romance novels, right? It's just eight romance novels. Yeah. 
And let's just acknowledge how beautiful everyone is. Everyone is so I mean. beautiful. Just the most symmetrical people you've ever seen. Oh, oh, just so beautiful. Including one of my favorite actors who I have loved since he was in Phoebe Waller-Bridge's show Crashing, which only had one season because she wrote Fleabag at the Fringe and then got Fleabag on HBO, I think is what happened. So there was never a second season of this very, very good and interesting show called Crashing that everyone should watch. It's on Netflix. He, His name is... Um, Jonathan Bailey, and he played in Crashing, he played Sam. Uh, and he wasn't the main character of that series. He was, a, he was a, a side character, but he stole the fucking show. He was amazing. And he plays Anthony in Bridgerton. He was very good. Also, shout out to Adjua Ando, who plays yeah. Lady Danbury. Yes. She's a well-established stage actress. No surprise there. Yeah. And what I loved about her was the twinkle in her eye, and she was clearly having so much fun playing this character. Yeah, no, she's amazing. She's one of my favorites. And honestly, I respond so well to the wise, no-nonsense, older female character. It really mm -hmm. makes me think, like, maybe I need needed a grandmother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Maybe I just am experiencing the loss of a strong, badass grandmother, because <laughs> between Lady Danbury and Olena Tyrell, I mean, I just, I'm, a, I'm done. I'll just do whatever the two of you tell me to do. Please, just just instruct yeah. me and that's what I'm gonna yeah she's amazing and uh what's his name Reggae Jean Page Reggae Jean Page yeah he's very beautiful I will say I felt like his character he got some he got some good emotional um arc in his backstory but like yeah. we saw the reason that he's being a jerk but we don't see him fall in love with her I was like I would have really liked to have seen that guy act yeah and that's not his fault that's just, yeah, that's just what he was given. Maybe you want to give him some emotional content next time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, he's a rake, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that body type. It's um, like the very tall, willowy people who look so good in those fucking clothes. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like Jeremy Irons in a long coat. Oh, my God. He's not in this, but he's like my archetype for this, for who looks good in those clothes. Jeremy Irons and the other <laughs> willowy of the world. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I yeah, I'm a I'm a relatively square peasant based form. So I I just admire your ability to wear the clothes, guys. It was really nice to watch. Thank you. You and I would never find our place in this oh, Regency no. era film yeah. and television world. Well, and how hilarious that the fat white girls only get uh Penelope Featherington. Like she's yeah. okay, she's like, okay, that's us. Okay, so we know where we would be <laughs> in this in this husband market, I was like, so that's me. So I'm in a horribly unbecoming dress and hairstyle in a corner. And spoiler alert, just writing down the shit everyone else is doing and telling everybody about it. I was like, uh-huh, that's 100. I get it. Yep, that is accurate. Uh-huh. Like finding myself in it. always Like it's always a problem in Regency stuff just because my personality has not been shaped by that society. I have yeah. no financial resources, so I would not have ever had to face any of it. Like the most important thing in my life is not who I'm going to give my dowry to. It's right. how to get a job and pay my right. own rent, you know, yeah. very distant. And then the person that I'm like, oh, that's the person I'm supposed to identify with. I'm like, of, of course. Like, I love that actress. Um, she's in Dairy Girls too. Uh, Nicola Coughlin, I think is how we say it, who plays Penelope Featherington slash Lady Whistledown. Uh, she's adorable. She's amazing. And she has, but, but the thing that's great about her is that she actually has a, an emotional arc. Like, she has a real story. And I think that's yeah. one of the dividing lines in the the show, is that some characters get real stories and some characters don't. And mm -hmm. it's confusing to me who gets one and who doesn't and why. Because yeah. the Duke, he he has a little bit of backstory, but he doesn't really get a real story, I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Daphne does. Sure. Anthony very much does. All the Bridgertons do. Right. Which I guess mm -hmm. we can, you know, thank the title and the focus of the, the books <laughs> for that. But but P Penelope Featherington is not a Bridgerton, but she has a real emotional arc. And several people in her household also experience things in a real human way that we get to see. So just it's just very confusing. It's very confusing to me yeah. from an emotional standpoint. The show is very popular. I think it, it's doing very well. Mm. It's definitely embedded itself in the. Uh, cultural uh, psyche of the moment. And I think part of the reason for that is it is at its core, ultimately escapism. It is romance. It is yeah. drama, lots of juicy drama. 
Yeah. It's escapism, but it's, it's, oh, that's a really great point. Here it is. Here it is. It's escapism that is showing us in a very on the nose way, more often than we would expect, exactly what it is we're trying to escape. Women have no real choices in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, you know, that scene where I was talking about where he's like actively looking for consent for sexual stuff, where he's asking mm -hmm. her what she likes, etc. You know, those things. The, the fact that uh, the men in her life decide what's a problem and what's not. She doesn't get to decide what's a problem and what's not. Yeah. And that's all very on the surface, too. So I, that, I think, is the is the the reason I kept watching and the reason I watched it again. Is like mm -hmm. we're we're escaping and it's beautiful and it's a confection, but we're also seeing what they're trying to escape and that shit's real and it's still happening, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that as we culturally are adjusting the way we look at the past, mm -hmm. it's natural that as we create art about that, we're going to have some missteps, right? Yes. We haven't quite figured it all out. Yes, I mean, we never will. But <laughs> truthfully, <laughs> but as we as we adjust our lens on that it's we're gonna it's gonna be janky at times yeah just like the show is yeah. and I appreciate the ambition involved in like okay if we're gonna talk about the whole world we're gonna talk about the whole world and that involves mm. a bunch of stuff that a lot of people don't really want to talk about because it doesn't yeah. impact them because they have privilege like so I really enjoy that aspect of it a lot yeah. um, and I think ultimately that's probably why I was like willing to to not only see it through, but watch it again and make sure that I, you know, had engaged with it properly because it is trying. <laughs> it's trying to make art in a new way. Yeah. And I love that. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was our take on Bridgerton. Yes. I, I, we're going to talk about it again because I'm not going to stop talking about it. Um, it was so delightful to see you. Good to talk to you, Teresa. Everyone, we will be back uh, in the next episode. Please email us at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com if you have any comments, questions, thoughts, desires, <laughs> and we will see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Testing. Great. Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com. 